Today on Brief History, we take a look at an English Tudor king who would come to the throne as a boy of only nine years of age. As a vulnerable child king, his reign would be defined by the powerful men that surrounded and influenced him as he grew into a man. His time as king would see rebellion, intense religious change, political strife, and an unfortunate and tragic ending. Join me as I take a brief look at the boy king remembered today as Edward VI of England. Edward was born on October 12, 1537, at the magnificent Hampton Court Palace in England. He was the son of the famous King Henry VIII of England, and his mother was Jane Seymour. Edward's father, King Henry VIII, is perhaps the most well-known of all the kings of England, and this is due in part to the incredible events that took place during his reign. He was a larger-than-life figure, who as time progressed became ever more tyrannical and frightening, being fiercely dedicated to achieving his goals at any cost. This is evidenced by an array of events, but two specifically require brief mentioning as a precursor to Edward's story. The first thing to note is that Edward's father would marry six wives throughout his life, two of which would be famously executed by beheading. Edward's mother, Jane Seymour, was his third wife and unfortunately would pass away shortly after Edward's birth. Edward would thus be the first and only child between his parents, his father's only legitimate son, and thus the heir to the English throne. However, Edward did have two elder half-sisters, Mary, who was the daughter of Edward's father's first queen, Catherine of Aragon, who he divorced, and Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Edward's father's second queen, Anne Boleyn, who was one of the wives executed by beheading. Both of Edward's half-sisters will come up again throughout his story. The second important thing to touch on in relation to Edward's father's reign is the incredible religious changes that began during his reign, which included an incredible break with the Catholic Church. The papacy in Rome had battled for centuries with English kings over control of the English clergy, but had emerged as the ultimate authority over the church in England. Edward's father, in pursuit of a divorce from his first wife, would incredibly break from this ecclesiastical system, which saw the Pope as the head of the Church of England. Through a series of parliamentary acts, he would eventually declare that he, the King of England, was the head of the English Church. The ideas of Martin Luther were still fresh in Europe, and Protestantism was spreading throughout the continent at this time. Although Edward's father did not fully adopt Protestantism, he nevertheless would find that, with his shifting mind and ruthless nature, he would stray further and further from the Orthodox Catholic faith as his quest for supreme power continued to grow. It is important to note the overall dispute slash disagreements between Catholics and Protestants here, as this will be a topic that will come up again later in Edward's story. Henry was excited for the birth of Edward and added a nursery to the building works at Hampton Court, which were finished just prior to his mother going into labor. Later claims would be made that Edward was born by cesarean section, but there is little evidence to support this claim. Edward was born on the eve of the Feast of the Translation of the Anglo-Saxon Saint Edward the Confessor, for whom Edward was named. He unfortunately would never meet his mother, as his mother lived for only 12 days after his birth before she died. He was christened three days after his birth, with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, serving as Edward's godfather. Edward's maternal uncles, Edward Seymour and Thomas Seymour, were present as well. Archbishop Cranmer, Edward Seymour, and Thomas Seymour will all be discussed in much more detail throughout Edward's story. Additionally, both of Edward's half-sisters, 21-year-old Mary and 4-year-old Elizabeth, were present at his christening as well, with Mary serving as Edward's godmother. Henry's father had for years been hoping for a son, an heir, and with Edward's birth he was overcome with joy. At the christening, the infant Edward was declared as the Duke of Cornwall, and at the subsequent celebrations, his uncle, Edward Seymour, was raised to the earldom of Hartford. Edward spent his early childhood, quote, among the women, and was looked after by wet nurses and various other women, including a dry nurse and under nurses, aka rockers of the cradle. He was said to have been a very merry and pleasant child. 
Because Edward was his father's only legitimate son and heir to the throne, his well-being and safety was paramount. No chances were taken, and strangers were forbidden to enter his room. Additionally, his food and drink were closely monitored. No one under the degree of knight was allowed into his presence, and his servants were forbidden from traveling to London, where plague could easily infect someone. Despite this, and Edward's generally good health, he would come down with a fever in the autumn of 1541 when he was four years old. He would recover from this, but as one could imagine, many held their breath with regards to the young prince's sickness, as the future of the monarchy lay upon his survival. In July 1544, when Edward was six years old, the household that was set up for him was dissolved, and he then entered the world of men. It was also time for him to begin his serious education, which included having two humanist mentors being assigned to him. The first was a man named Richard Cox, a severe disciplinarian who held nothing back from the princely Edward just because of his status. The second was a man named John Cheek, a secondary mentor, but nonetheless a brilliant and respected scholar in England. Cheek was less assertive than Cox, and the two together formed a strong base for Edward's learning. Edward was a fast learner. He began to read and write, writing letters to his father's sixth and final wife, Queen Catherine Parr his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, and to his godfather, Archbishop Cranmer. He learned French, Latin, and eventually some Spanish and Italian. He was educated to believe in the value of knowledge and delighted in everything related to his father, the king. Visiting his father was indeed a special treat that Edward enjoyed immensely. He was taught music and astronomy, archery, the writings of Machiavelli, and seems to have been able to grasp the theological Catholic and Protestant debate that was raging throughout Europe during that time. It is also important to note that his mentors, Cox and Cheek, would eventually become serious Protestants, something that may or may not have had serious influence on Edward's religious leanings, which will be discussed in time. Edward was just a boy, a prince, growing up as a prince does in that time. But all that would change in January 1547, when his father, King Henry VIII, died. Now, as heir to the English throne, the heavy burden of kingship was to fall on Edward's nine-year-old shoulders. It is believed that Edward was at Hartford Castle when his father died, to which he was soon moved to London, where he was lodged in the Tower. History had shown that minority kingships carried many unknowns and had historically been a time of great unrest. Edward was king, but of course his rule must be led by designated adults. Edward's father's will, a controversial topic in itself which will not be discussed in detail here, had laid out guardians for Edward's minority until he reached the age of 18. It has been argued that Henry VIII had inched closer and closer to Protestantism and further from Catholicism in the latter part of his life, and the fact that Edward's appointed counselors were of the reformist flavor adds evidence to this claim. Whether this actually was intended to be a catalyst for further religious change in England, or whether Edward's father wished to simply defend his royal supremacy and hedge against a resurgence of Catholic conservatism cannot be fully known. Whatever the case, we will see that reformist ideologies will gain greatly in England during Edward's time as king. Three days after Edward's father's death, the executors of his will elected Edward's maternal uncle discussed previously, Edward Seymour, as protector, essentially giving him freedom to reign as he pleased. Edward Seymour had served in both Scotland and France in the last years of Edward's father's reign, and was at the time still Earl of Hartford, but would shortly thereafter be raised to the Dukedom of Somerset. Some were not happy with this appointment, specifically Edward's other maternal uncle, Thomas Seymour. Although there may have been some shady dealings that led to Edward Seymour becoming protector, including bribery, there was precedent that had been set with regards to minority kings having their uncles installed as protector. Henry VI and Edward V both come to mind. Although the protector in these instances had been a paternal uncle, the young Edward had no paternal uncles, so a maternal uncle would have been a logical option. Edward soon processed from the Tower of London to Westminster for his coronation where he was crowned on February 20th, 1547. It has been argued that Edward Seymour, henceforth to be referred to as Somerset, was fiercely dedicated to financial responsibility and material gain. He took over the business of running the country, leaving Edward free to live as a young, learning king at court. 
Somerset was not only keen on finance, but also on the defense of the realm, specifically from the French and the Scots. Prior to Edward's father's death, he had set up a marriage for Edward to the daughter of the recently deceased James V of Scotland. Her name was Mary, famously known today as Mary, Queen of Scots. This was all part of something often referred to as the rough wooing of Scotland. Additionally, it was the English intention to enforce religious changes on the Scottish church, which had remained of the old faith, and also to prevent the French from utilizing Scotland as a way to harass England, something they had done for decades prior. However, in the end, the marriage between Edward and the young Mary, Queen of Scots, was not forthcoming, and eventually the Scots and the French did come to terms, rekindling the Old Alliance, as it's referred to. The French king at the time of Edward's ascension, Francis I, had died shortly after Edward was crowned, and his son and successor, Henry II of France, after the experiences with England during Edward's father's reign, was ready to take the fight to the English. Protector Somerset led an army into Scotland and won a notable victory at the Battle of Pinkey in September 1547. Despite this, things remained difficult in Scotland, and in early 1548, discussions for a marriage between Mary, Queen of Scots, and Henry II's son, the Dauphin, began and were concluded. Despite efforts to prevent this, Mary was safely removed from Scotland to France, ending any hopes that a marriage to Edward would indeed come to fruition. Another English offensive was planned for Scotland, but was prevented by events we will soon discuss. While Protector Somerset was in Scotland, other serious events were taking place in England. Edward was limited in what he was allowed financially by the Protector, and was, at his age, extremely vulnerable to manipulation. Edward's other maternal uncle, Thomas Seymour, the younger brother of the Protector, wanted more than what he was being allowed. He wanted more power, more standing, and specifically wished to be Edward's governor. He set out to manipulate whoever he could, including young Edward, to achieve his goals. Seymour was a gentleman of the privy chamber, which gave him access to the rooms around Edward. He used this to gain access to Edward's servants, who he began convincing to communicate with Edward on his behalf. He used this tactic to secure a marriage blessing for himself to Edward's father's last queen, Catherine Parr, although the two had actually already married before the influenced blessing was given by Edward. Seymour began to gain favor with Edward by being generous to him, going as far as giving him spending money, something that the easily influenced Edward appreciated. Seymour was also alleged to have made questionable sexual advances at Edward's half-sister, the young Princess Elizabeth, around 15 years old in 1548. Never content with his position, and after constantly trying to undermine his brother the Protector, through attempted manipulation, and after commenting about the potential ease in which someone could kidnap Edward, the bottom soon fell out for Seymour. He was attainted by Parliament and executed by beheading in March of that year. This may have been Edward's first tough experience with politics, but it was far from the end of the drama in Edward's reign. Edward's godfather, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, was a devout reformist and had done what he could during the reign of Edward's father to further this ideology. Yet his hands were still somewhat tied while Edward's father lived, as Edward's father, as we touched on previously, was no committed Protestant. Once Edward became king, Cranmer felt that he had more freedom to implement more serious changes into England. As we will see, the furthering of the Protestant ideology in England would take place, and Cranmer was a driving force behind these changes. However, Cranmer was well aware of the lack of enthusiasm for religious change by the English clergy, and thus decided to begin accommodating refugee Protestants from the continent. In April 1547, Emperor Charles V had defeated the Lutheran Schmalkaldic League at the Battle of Mühlberg, and the subsequent Augsburg Interim and Imperial Diet of 1548 essentially forbade Lutheranism throughout the empire on the continent. This, mixed with Cranmer's openness to aiding and harboring Protestants in England, led to a mass influx of foreign Protestants into the country, both from the empire and other European countries. These groups of Protestants would eventually be organized into communities in London, which were known as Stranger Churches. There was a German Stranger Church, a French Stranger Church, an Italian Stranger Church, etc., etc. These Stranger Churches will come up again briefly later in Edward's story. Only a few months after Edward's coronation, the Edwardian Injunctions of 1547 came to be. This drastically altered the church service that was observed in England, and it has been argued that this was a major step towards a fully Protestant England. 
Certain practices, such as that of lighting candles, kissing, kneeling, and processions were deemed as superstitious. Holy bread and water were removed, resulting in a new, bland service. Additionally, images and relics were condemned, with stained glass, shrines, and statues being defaced or destroyed. In a November 1547 Parliament, the Act of Six Articles, which was passed during Edward's father's reign, was repealed. This act had held that in many debated topics, such as transubstantiation of the Eucharist, that the traditional, i.e. Catholic ways were to be maintained. With this repeal, reformist ideas had some breathing room within England. It is also important to note that Edward's father, in his break with the Catholic Church, had also set about attacking the clerical estate by confiscating their wealth throughout England. This was done through Acts of Parliament and is known today as the dissolution of the monasteries. Edward's government continued on with this practice, passing the Chantries Act of 1547, which abolished all the remaining chantries and confiscated their assets, although steps towards this had been made years prior. The Sacrament Act was also passed in December 1547, which allowed the laity to take both bread and wine, aka communion in both kinds. Additionally, a statute was passed allowing the clergy to take wives, eliminating the celibacy that had set them apart in the centuries prior. This all culminated in the Book of Common Prayer, which was prepared under Cranmer's leadership and presented to Parliament in December 1548. In early 1549, this book was given statutory authority with the passing of the Act of Uniformity of 1549. The prayer book confirmed many of the topics we just touched on, but much else was to change with regards to religion in England as well. Services were to be conducted in English, plain vestments were to be worn, kneeling and holding up of hands were to be optional, holding up of the host was forbidden, certain traditions related to baptism were forbidden, and the blessing of the ring in marriage was forgotten. All in all, the result was a dumbed-down, simplified service, which clearly indicated a break from the past. Although this was a major step towards Protestantism in England, the book was not well received, specifically by Protestants, who perceived the book to be too conservative. The prayer book is something that we will return to. Major changes were taking place in England, led by Protector Somerset and Archbishop Cranmer. However, this, mixed with serious economic and social issues, which we will soon discuss, would lead to unrest in Edward's kingdom. Over the years, England's population had been rising, and the competition for resources, as one could expect, became more intense. One area of competition to note was that of land. Land use had been increasing, as had violence and dispute in regards to the usage of land. Much of the violence was rural in nature and was conducted through something called enclosure riots. Enclosure riots essentially were the destruction of areas that had been sectioned off or enclosed by someone else. The riots would see a destruction of hedges, ditches, or fences in protest of said land being closed off. This was nothing new in Edward's time. The issue with enclosure had been a source of contention for decades. It had been a lesser issue of previous rebellions, but now in the 1530s and 1540s, it became one of the main grievances for many. The issue of enclosure and enclosure riots is another topic that is quite complex and will not be discussed in full detail here, but it is important to understand the rural nature of them and the growing discontent that was mounting. Edward's government had tried to address some of these issues, but ended up confusing many into further destruction of enclosures. But although tensions existed in relation to these issues, it was the prayer book and the religious changes that had been implemented that would lead to the start of rebellion. In 1549, rebellions broke out in Cornwall in the southwest, known as the Western Rising or the Prayer Book Rebellion. They began to spread, eventually moving on to Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire. By July, the rebels posed a real threat, and a substantial force was needed to suppress the revolt. By August, the rebels were defeated, with the leaders being executed. Although economic factors may have played a partial role in this uprising, it has been argued that the religious changes were the driving factor behind the rebellion. The same cannot be said for another rebellion that took place in July of the same year, whose main complaints included overuse of common land, corruption, self-interest, and to a much lesser degree, enclosure. This rebellion is known today as Ketz Rebellion, 
and it has been put forward that although this uprising is often seen as mostly rural, there was a large urban component to the rising as well. This rebellion originated in the east, in the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk, with the leader of the rebellion being a man named Robert Kett, hence the name Kett's Rebellion. This rebellion too would be suppressed, with the rebels being defeated and Kett being captured and executed. The rebellions showed that there were many problems in England at the time, and that the religious changes put forth in the prayer book were not simply going to be accepted widespread throughout England. The rebellions also left Protector Somerset in a vulnerable position, as many of his colleagues began to doubt him after unrest presented itself. His initial conciliatory mindset had been seen as ineffective in handling the rebellions, and after doubts arose with relation to his rule, his personality became hardened. He began to exhibit tyrannical traits, ignoring others' advice and blaming others for problems. Other counselors soon began to meet in London and were soon plotting against him. These London lords, as they would eventually be referred to, spooked Somerset, who began to raise troops. By October, Somerset moved Edward to Windsor, the journey of which was said to have given Edward a cold. Communication went back and forth between the London lords and Somerset, but in the end, Somerset's allies dwindled to the point that he had no option but to surrender, as the councillors remained steadfast that Somerset's power was derived from them and not from Edward's father's will. Within a week, he was removed from Edward's presence and placed under guard. Eventually, both Edward and Somerset were moved back to London, where Somerset was interrogated and confessed to a list of articles laid against him, most of which were aimed at his ambition and failure to heed advice from others. It has been put forward that Somerset's fall from grace was actually a coup d'etat, as Somerset's rival would essentially become his successor. This man's name was John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, and although Somerset would be released from prison, pardoned, and would find his way back to the council, eventually he would be executed under Dudley's leadership. Dudley would eventually be elevated to the Dukedom of Northumberland, which was specifically created for him. Dudley immediately took control of Edward, with Edward's life being reorganized so that many of his close gentlemen were removed and replaced by Dudley's close allies. However, after Somerset's smuggling of Edward to Windsor, the council became worried about physical control of Edward, and thus appointed a group of lords to be with Edward physically at all times. It was said that Dudley, although not technically Edward's protector, had significantly more control over Edward than Somerset ever did. Many noted how Edward was becoming sharper as a young man, but still was subject to Dudley in the end. Nevertheless, Edward was certainly becoming more anxious in his limited position and wished to grow into a larger role as king. This brought forth an interesting dilemma for Dudley, a dilemma that Somerset never really had to deal with when Edward was in his youth. Dudley needed to keep complete control over Edward, but also needed to heed somewhat to Edward's growing ambitious nature. He also needed simultaneously to prepare Edward for the duties of king, which would soon be falling on his shoulders. Edward began to attend council meetings, especially when great matters were being discussed. But again, he was never allowed any type of control in the matters, the government remained in control of Dudley, and actual decisions were made elsewhere. But Dudley's position would never be as secure as Somerset's once was. Bad harvests, disease, serious money problems, religious tension, and a fear of returning rebellions made Dudley's time in power tense. Add to this an alleged plot against Dudley by Somerset, which would, as stated previously, lead to his execution, and it was becoming clear that Dudley would never rest easy in his position. But the previous religious changes in England had changed the trajectory of religion in England, and now the rivalry between the Catholics and Protestants would take center stage in the drama. The major religious changes that had taken place in England, which included the movement against images, the dissolution of the chantries, the relaxing of heresy laws, and of course the introduction of the unpopular prayer book, were continued. Due to the prayer book's unpopularity, a second prayer book was developed in 1552, which was clearly more Protestant in doctrine and practice. But the interesting thing to note is that Protestantism was not wholly united in England or abroad. There were many divisions amongst Protestants, especially among the stranger churches, who, as we recall, were essentially refugee churches in England from foreigners fleeing religious persecution on the continent. Archbishop Cranmer throughout the years had hoped to bring Protestant ideology together and to form a consensus among the disputing Protestant factions, 
He hoped to revise canon law, and if this were achieved, hoped to counter what the Catholic Church had done at the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent essentially being the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation. But bringing together the Protestant factions would prove to be impossible, not only due to disagreement between the factions, but also due to quarrels that began to arise now between the clergy and the laity, more specifically between Archbishop Cranmer and Dudley. In 1553, Cranmer presented the Reformatio Legum Ecclesiasticarum, which would have greatly increased the clergy's authority over the laity. But this was blocked by Dudley in the House of Lords and never revived. However, in addition to the Second Book of Common Prayer, Archbishop Cranmer also developed a statement of doctrine for the church. This was intended to create a concise doctrinal statement for all and clearly asserted the justification by faith alone clearly denied transubstantiation of the Eucharist and sacrifice of masses, and clearly condemned popery. This doctrinal statement is known as the 42 Articles, and was issued by the Council in 1553. Although the Second Prayer Book and the 42 Articles were clearly a large step towards Protestantism, it has been argued that the earlier Prayer Book of 1549 had implemented the more shocking changes to the general public. It is also interesting to note that there was a tense debate amongst the clergy in relation to kneeling at communion. This was clearly addressed with an addendum to the prayer book, which is known as the Black Rubric. Edward, for his part, was seemingly becoming more dedicated to the idea of Protestantism, and this is perhaps partially evidenced by the disagreements with his half-sister Mary. Mary was unapologetically Catholic and refused to abide by the 1549 prayer book. She had been allowed, with pressure from imperial ambassadors, to continue to observe Catholic Mass in her private chamber, either alone or with two or three of her women, but her household as a whole was forced to conform to the religious changes. But Mary would continually be harassed and bullied, and attempts to smuggle her out of England were unsuccessfully attempted. Soon her chaplains were arrested, with Edward writing angry letters to and meeting with his non-conforming sister in order to chastise her for her disobedience. Emperor Charles had threatened war if Mary was not allowed to observe her mass, and although Edward was said to have remained steadfast in his beliefs, he eventually gave way. Whether or not Edward's distaste for his sister's actions was based solely on religion, or whether this was perhaps due to the fact that Edward simply wished to be obeyed as king, cannot be truly known, but it was clear that Mary's actions were not simply accepted or ignored by Edward. But a bigger problem was now presenting itself. Edward, with the Catholic Mary as his technical successor, was becoming ill. Although Edward had been sick many times previously, in early 1553, Edward caught a cold, which developed into a fever by February of that year. The result would be a sickness which he would not be able to fully recover from. He was confined to his room and grew sickly and thin. He developed a cough to which he would discharge a foul-smelling green, yellow, black, and pink mucus from his nose and throat and would eventually begin to lose his hair and nails. His doctors, perplexed, were unfortunately not able to determine what was causing his illness. His diet and exercise was monitored, and after a while he began to take the air when the weather cooperated. In April he moved to Greenwich, but remained very weak and reclusive. His body, specifically his legs and stomach, began to swell, causing him to have to lay on his back. He found it very difficult to rest, being plagued by violent fever, and was in an all-around unfortunate state. Many in the modern day have attempted to determine what Edward could have been suffering from. Tuberculosis has been put forward, but so too has a type of pneumonia been put forward, something that could never have been treated without antibiotics or medicine of the modern day. Soon many could see the writing on the wall, and Edward, after suffering greatly from the affliction, eventually gave up hope. But now that Edward's sickness was determined to be terminal, there arose a glaring issue with regard to the succession. The Succession Act of 1544 stated that if Edward were to die childless, his half-sister Mary would inherit the throne. This was a major problem, and not acceptable to many, including Edward and Dudley, as Mary had, as we have already seen, remained dedicated to the Catholic faith. If Mary became queen, she would surely undo all Protestant gains that had been made in England. Thus, sometime around February and March of 1553, 
Edward drafted a document titled My Device for the Succession. This document incredibly barred both his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, from the succession and instead attempted to bestow the succession to his Aunt Mary's lineage. Edward's Aunt Mary was his father's younger sister and had been married to the King of France before marrying a man named Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. She had died in 1533 and had no living sons. Therefore, the succession was to continue through her eldest living daughter, Edward's first cousin, Francis Brandon. Francis had married a man named Henry Gray and was known at the time as Francis Gray. Edward's device document initially granted the throne to the heirs male of Francis Gray, and if Francis was to not produce a male heir, then the throne would pass through Francis's daughter's heirs male. Francis, at the time 35 years old, had three daughters. The youngest daughter was named Mary Gray, 8 years old. The middle daughter was named Catherine Gray, 12 years old. And the eldest daughter was 15-year-old Jane Gray. Although this was an incredible move, it should be noted that Edward's father had recognized the Gray's claim to the English throne after his children in 1544 with the Third Succession Act. However, there was a serious problem with this change. Not only did Frances Gray have no sons, but all three of her daughters also did not have sons. Thus, as Edward's inevitable death approached, the device was altered. A small but very important change was made to Edward's device, as a sentence which had stated, to the Lady Jane's heirs male, was now altered to read, to the Lady Jane and her heirs male. This change therefore allowed the throne to incredibly fall to the eldest of Frances's daughters, Lady Jane. Many believe that Edward had been influenced by Dudley, whose younger son, Lord Guildford Dudley, had married Jane Grey, but many in the modern day believe that it was Edward who was the driving factor behind the alteration. Religion was obviously a major factor in the adjustment of the succession, but so too was legitimacy. Mary and Elizabeth were certainly heirs to the crown through an act of parliament, but they were also still illegitimate, coming from different wives of Edward's father. Therefore, Mary was disqualified due to her religion, yes, but also due to her illegitimacy. Elizabeth, whose religion was in line with Edward's, failed only in the illegitimacy category. It is said that many were hesitant to subscribe to the change to the succession plan, but that Dudley, in a rage, influenced and intimidated them into submission. Edward, too, displayed anger at some of those reluctant to partake in the matter. By June, most of the major governmental figures had signed off. Dudley bestowed lands to needed allies, reinforced strongholds, gathered troops, and negotiated with French to secure his position. Rumors began to flow that Edward was already dead, and so Edward showed himself at a window at Greenwich one final time in late June 1553, still looking incredibly emaciated and weak. Finally, on the evening of July 6, 1553, the 15-year-old King Edward VI of England was relieved from his miserable afflictions and died from his sickness in his bedchamber at Greenwich Palace, surrounded by a few courtiers. His last words were alleged to have been, I am faint, Lord have mercy upon me and take my spirit. Edward's death was kept secret for obvious reasons, as the groundwork needed to be laid for the change in succession. By the 10th, Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed queen in London, but incredibly, Dudley had not taken the steps to secure the person of Princess Mary. To the horror of Dudley and the council, she fled, and although she was seemingly isolated and pursued by Dudley and his forces, Mary found that there was support for her in the areas away from London. Mary was proclaimed queen on the 19th, and by the time Dudley had returned after unsuccessfully attempting to capture Mary, he found that the London councillors had deserted him and also proclaimed Mary as queen after word of her support in the provinces reached them. No nobleman of the Protestant belief supported Mary, and those who did support her were committed Catholics. Dudley was arrested and convicted of treason. Before his execution, he returned to Catholicism, renounced Protestantism, and was executed in late August 1553. Jane Grey and her husband, Dudley's son, would also be executed, but not until February of the following year. Due to the tense events following his death, Edward was not buried until almost a month later in August 1553. He was moved to Westminster, being placed in a white marble vault beneath an altar in his grandfather Henry VII's Lady Chapel. The vault was eventually lost, but rediscovered in 1685. 
To this day, Edward still lies close to the intricate tomb of his grandfather and grandmother, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, in Westminster Abbey. A decorative stone can be seen in front of the altar, which reads, in memory of King Edward VI, buried in this chapel. Coming to the throne as a young boy and following in the shadow of his famous father, Edward's time as king was much different than many other kings' reigns from the start. He unfortunately would not live long enough to be able to experience what it would be like to truly wield any power, being limited by his vulnerability and youth. Thus, the story of Edward's reign must walk hand in hand with the history and stories of the powerful men that surrounded and had influence over him during that short time. The Duke of Northumberland, John Dudley, the reformist-minded Archbishop Cranmer, and of course, his uncle protector and Duke of Somerset, Edward Seymour. Although Edward's time as king was short, major changes and events took place during his time as king that should not be understated. He clearly was his father's son, both in personal affairs, to which many have argued that his developing personality was showing signs that he would be as his father in this regard, strong-willed and imperious in nature, but also in governmental and spiritual affairs, continuing in his father's footsteps with regard to faith. Of course, how much of the incredible religious change that took place during Edward's reign can be directly attributed to him is difficult to say. Was Edward truly someone that was fiercely committed to furthering the Protestant cause and to destroying Catholic conservatism in England in his own independent mind? Or was he perhaps just an easily influenced young boy, born into the role of king but not yet matured, who acted on the advice and influence of the powerful men around him? Perhaps both are somewhat true. Of course, in the early part of his reign as a boy of nine, he surely was influenced greatly by those around him and could have provided little direction at that age. But by the time of his death, he and his mind had for some time been growing and becoming more independent. And thus, the attempted succession changes very well could, or perhaps are likely to be, the result of Edward's own personal agenda. Certainly, his reign was not without drama. The economic and religious rebellions that took place early on, the dramatic events surrounding his protectors and family during his life, and the interesting and odd sequence of events that took place after his death make Edward's story an incredibly interesting one to reflect upon. But alas, Edward's reign in the end should surely be considered a tragedy, for not only was this king of England never able to wield any true power, and not only was his life cut short in a most disturbing and terrible manner, and not only were his wishes for the succession turned to dust immediately after his death, but Edward's reign is often overlooked or overshadowed by the reigns of his famous father and sisters. What type of king Edward would have truly become if he had lived longer, we can never know. But Edward remains in an important place in time, at a crossroads in English history. And although his personal role may have been limited, the reign of this boy king did indeed leave a lasting impact on the world.